Luke chapter 10, verses 1 through 11 and 16 through 20. After this, the Lord appointed 72 others and sent them two by two ahead of him to every town and place where he was about to go. He told them, the harvest is plentiful, but the workers are few. Ask the Lord of the harvest, therefore, to send out workers into his harvest field. Go, I am sending you out like lambs among wolves. Do not take a purse or bag or sandals and do not greet anyone on the road. When you enter a house, first you say, peace to this house. If a man of peace is there, your peace will rest on him. If not, it will return to you. Stay in that house, eating and drinking whatever they give you, for the worker deserves his wages. Do not move around from house to house. When you enter a town and are welcomed, eat what is set before you. Heal the sick who are there and tell them, the kingdom of God is near you. But when you enter a town and are not welcome, go into its streets and say, Even the dust of your town that sticks to our feet we wipe off against you. Yet be sure of this, the kingdom of God is near. He who listens to you listens to me. He who rejects you rejects me. But he who rejects me rejects him who sent me. The seventy-two returned with joy and said, Lord, even the demons submit to us in your name. He replied, I saw Satan fall like lightning from heaven. I have given you authority to trample on snakes and scorpions and to overcome all the power of the enemy. Nothing will harm you. However, do not rejoice that the spirits submit to you, but rejoice that your names are written in heaven. Today, I want to talk about joy. There was once a young boy who went to spend the week with his grandfather on a farm. While walking around, he noticed the chickens. They were scratching and playing around. The little lad said, they ain't got it. Next, he saw a coat in the field playing and kicking up its heels, to which he replied, he ain't got it. After examining all the animals on the yard, he hadn't found one that had the it he was looking for. The boy finally went in to search the barn. There he found an old donkey. When he saw the donkey's long, frowning face and the way the donkey just stood there, he screamed for his grandfather to come quick. He jumped up and down and said, I found it, I found it. The boy kept yelling. When his grandfather asked what he had found, he said, Papa, I found an animal that has the same kind of religion as you. <laughs> now, when reading that, it sounds really funny, but I've also noticed this phenomenon in the church. Most people, if you ask, do you want to go to church? Would you like to be a Christian? The first thing they would say is, no, not really. Why? They're kind of miserable people. As a matter of fact, in Bible study this past week, we sat and had a discussion because we were talking about, you know, living in the moment and getting the fullness out of life. Most of us at the table had at one point or another been servers at some type of restaurant. And the one thing we all had in common was to say that Sundays were the worst time to be waiters or waitresses because quote unquote church people would come in and they would always be the rudest, <laughs> the most miserable. They'd always find something wrong with everything you gave them. And at the end of all that running around, they never wanted to tip. So it was always something that you didn't look forward to when you knew you had to work Sundays. And so as I began to prepare for this message and I really began to look at the, the scriptures that we had, looking at Psalm 66, the first thing it says, it says, shout for joy unto the Lord. And that hit me, because God has really called us to live in joy. And so I began to ponder, I began to think, and I began to think, why are Christians so unhappy? I mean, why, why are we so miserable sometimes? Why the people that are supposed to be the most blessed, the most, you know, overcoming, why do we seem to be the ones that get so down, that become so downtrodden, so beaten down? Especially when, you know, the Bible gives us so many messages of how God wants us to be filled with joy and walking in joy and living in joy. Why exactly is it so hard for us? And then I came to the conclusion. Basically, we are our own worst enemies. You see, the Bible has already said that we have joy because God has filled us with joy. Jesus said, I came to give you life and life more abundantly. And the only way we lose that is if we give it up. You know, when looking at joy, the Bible says, shout joyfully to the Lord all the earth. Let those that seek God rejoice and be glad. Rejoice in the Lord, you righteous, and give thanks. Break forth in song, <coughs> rejoice and sing and praise. Be glad and rejoice with me. Now, I think we sometimes think joy is our happiness. 
and those things are synonymous, but in truth, it isn't. See, joy is a lot deeper than happiness because it doesn't depend on our emotions at all. The Bible actually interprets joy as a fruit of the Spirit. It comes from God. You know, it is the result of our relationship with God, of discovering the person, the power, and plan of God in our lives. No circumstance, no problem, nothing can take that away because our joy is from the being restored to Jesus himself. Our joy is simply because we know that our names are written in heaven. That is where our joy stems from. That is how we're supposed to walk around in joy no matter what circumstance we walk through. How do I get this joy? How do I keep this joy? How do I walk in joy? How do I live in joy? Those were the questions I asked myself because I'm standing up here and I will tell you there are days when I don't have joy. There are days when I am beaten down. There are days when I can't even pray because I'm like, God, why am I dealing with this? Why am I going through this? But you know, the Bible says that is not how we are supposed to be. So how do I get this joy? How do I keep this joy? You see, the key to joy and the key to getting joy is to realize that we must completely surrender to God. Surrender everything to God. Now, I'm not really a control freak, but when it comes to problems, <laughs> I can be a bit of a control freak. Because to me, if it's my problem, I need to be the one to fix it. Bianca can tell you, I am the world's worst when it comes to me trying to fix something because I don't want to hear anyone else's opinion. I don't want anyone else to tell me how to fix it. I'm going to do it. I'm going to do it myself. This is how I am. But that's not how God is calling us to be. He's actually telling us, you know what? Those things that drive you crazy, those things that drive you up a wall, those things that you just don't understand why and how, those are the very things that I want you to give to me. Those are the things that you need to turn over to me in order to have the joy that I have for you. You see, God is have like, it's like joy and our problems. God is saying, just trade over your problems and I will give you all of this joy. It's an amazing trade if you really think about it. Because this joy doesn't fade over time. It doesn't lessen no matter my circumstances. It's a joy so powerful that it will give us strength through any hardship we can come about. Now, you can get joy. You can have joy, but we must be careful to guard our joy. Because we know that the devil comes to steal, kill, and destroy. But what is he trying to steal? He's trying to steal your joy. Because if he steals your joy, now all of a sudden you're a Christian that has no joy. And you're walking around with your head hanging down. No one really wants to be around you because you're in the woe is me party. Once your joy is gone, then he starts tapping on your hope. He starts taking away the hope you have that things will look better in the future. And then we know what hope is. Hope is the basis of our very faith. So if the devil can steal your joy, he can get to your hope. And if he can get to your hope, then he now has your faith. So we must be careful to guard our joy with everything we have. It is our job to make sure the devil doesn't steal our joy because the Bible says that the joy of the Lord is your very strength. It is the very thing that sustains you in this walk. Because as a Christian, the enemy will come against you. The enemy will try to fight against you. But it is the thing that will carry you through any attack of the enemy. So I know what joy is. I know how to get it and hang on to it. Now, the great part about joy is the side effects. You know, it's not like the medicine that will cure one thing and cause 20 other problems. No, joy comes to heal and it gives you some great side effects. The first side effect of joy is laughter. Bianca gets on to me about this all the time because I don't really need amusement to laugh. I'm kind of my own amusement sometimes. I just sit and laugh at myself. And it's the ability to laugh. It's the ability to laugh that no matter what is going on, that joy provides. I don't care if your car just got taken away, your, your, house, your, you know, your house mortgage is due. Joy will allow you to laugh in the, in the midst of all of that. It will make you laugh when you you know, the rest of the world thinks you should be crying. A second side effect of joy is stamina. Because the attacks of the enemy can be endless. I know there, were, there was a period in my life where I felt like I was going from one thing to the next and I can never get ahead of anything. It was in those moments where that joy sustained me. It allowed me to keep my head above water. It allowed me to keep my focus solely on God, knowing that no matter what was coming my way, I was going to make it. You know, the Bible says, so then when the day of evil comes, you may be able to stand your ground 
And after you've done everything, you've done everything you can do, just stand. <coughs> That's what joy is. Joy will keep you standing when the waves of life are crashing against you. That is joy. A third effect of your joy is that it confuses the enemy. This is the one I like the most. You see, when the enemy is coming at you with both guns blazing, I mean, he's attacking your family, your job, your health, every which way you think he can come, he's coming at you. This is where joy comes into play. Because when you have joy in the midst of anything that enemy is doing, you can praise God. And when you begin to praise God in the midst of your circumstances, something miraculous happens. See, when you praise God in the midst of your circumstances, God begins to send angels and the angels begin to move around you. And it confuses the enemy because the enemy is thinking, how in the world can you praise when I am beating you over the head? How can you praise when everything in your life is turned upside down? How can you praise? It confuses him. And in that confusion, God makes a way and you begin to praise God until your breakthrough comes. See, that's what they say about praising until you get your breakthrough. It's not praising after the breakthrough. It's saying, I'm in the midst of a whole lot of crap right now, but it's okay because my breakthrough is on the way. And I'm going to praise God through this joy I have because this joy is going to see me to a better day. Amen. See, everlasting joy allows you to praise regardless of the circumstances. It allows you to praise no matter what it looks like. And when you begin to praise, the enemy's hands become stilled. Because see, the enemy's attack can be going around, but when the presence of God descends, oh, the enemy's hands stop. When the presence of God descends, all of those arrows that he's throwing at you, those fiery darts, oh, they fall to the ground. Because that's when the presence of God shows up. You know, they say in the presence of God there is power. There's, in the presence of God, there is peace. There is love. In the presence of God, there is everything you need. So when you can praise in the midst of your circumstances, whatever you need in the midst of that time, it shows up with the presence of God. Oh, it's a, it's a big deal. The last effect I want to talk about, and this is the one that the devil hates the most. The effect of joy is the fact that it's contagious. Joy is contagious. Have you ever been around people and, and all they could see was the bad in life? And I don't care how happy and excited you were, the moment you got around them, it just like... That's not how we're supposed to be. The Bible says that we are to infect people with joy. That means when I walk into a room, I don't care what the situation has been. I don't care what has been going on. When I step into the room, the very joy that is within me needs to infiltrate the entire atmosphere of the place, and it needs to become contagious. When I walk into a place, I don't care what mood you're in. I'm not going to let you steal what I have inside of me. Instead, I'm going to infect you with the praise on your lips to say, you know what? I know it looks bad right now, but if you could just praise for a little bit, I guarantee you it'll look a little bit better. That is what joy is. That is what God wants our joy to be like. It needs to be the very calling card of who we are. You know, people should not want to be around us because they want to feel bad. It's like, no, I can't, I can't, no. Because the moment I get around her, she's going to start telling me it's all going to be okay. I want to have my pity party. I can't go near her because the moment I get around her, she's going to make me want to believe that God is going to turn things around. That's how people should be. Like when they want to be sad, they run from us. <laughs> Because they want to be sad. Because our joy is so infectious. It's so infectious that we are touching everyone we step in contact with. See, joy is an amazing thing. Joy is our strength. Joy is our light. Joy keeps us wrapped up in God's presence. We can't let anyone steal that. We can't let anyone take that. We need to keep that to ourselves. And everywhere we go, just leave a little joy behind. Just leave a little joy behind. Let someone else feel that presence. Let someone else experience that joy. Just leave a little bit of joy behind. You know, and today, I don't know where you are. I don't know what your life has been like. I don't know what happened this week. I don't, I don't know what happened this morning. But I know one thing. The joy of the Lord covers it all. He will strengthen you. He will sustain you. And all you have to do is give it up. I know it's the hardest thing for us to do, but just let it go. Just let it go and let God take it over. 
And once you do that, he's going to fill you with an overflowing joy that you have never seen and never imagined. And guess what? Every single day it's, it's new. I, I wake up in the morning and I, I, I literally can feel the overflowing joy of God. Now, whether I stay in that is my choice. But if you just surrender everything to God, I guarantee you every single day he'll fill you up again. And when you pour it out, he'll fill you up some more. And when you pour it out, he'll fill it up some more. And the reason why I say when you pour it out is because you should be taking the joy that God has given you and pouring it out on people all around you. So that the more you pour out, the more he can pour in. And the more he pours in, that's the more you can pour out. Infectious. That is what God is calling us to do. And today, I leave you with that charge. Go and infect someone with the joy of the Lord. Because I guarantee you, when you start doing it, your life won't be the same, but neither will anyone's around you. Go be infectious for God. And the question is, do you have it? Thank you.